Cool. So um, today um, I've got a pretty lame talk title. It's um, funny at the time, but it really isn't. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, Amazon and the cloud more in general. I'm going to kind of concentrate on Amazon because I guess that's what most people know about a bit. Um, and it's certainly what I've been using recently. Um, I'm going to talk about machine imaging um, and Packer and Hobbit and Jenkins, um, which are a bunch of tools that you should be aware of and pretty much you should be using if you're doing any of this sort of thing. Um, so, quickly, a little more detail. Here. So, I'm going to spend the first slide telling you what I'm going to talk about. So, if you can decide it's boring, you can go out and pub for the next 40 minutes um, if things need to be um, So, this is going to be my thoughts, uh, kind of my opinions and my experiences um, on building up. I've got a hybrid in brackets because that's what we're doing at Yelp. Um, we have our own big centers, um, we, we have things in Amazon as well, but almost all of this applies if you're uh, just the cloud player. Um, so I'm going to talk about machine images. Um, and I, I should have said this is an audience interactive presentation, um, so feel free to like shout up or throw things at me, or like stick your hand up if, if I you know mention an acronym that makes no sense to you. Um, if I'm going completely over your head, then throw something at me. Um, so machine images. This, the idea is that you capture an entire machine kind of ready to run. Um, I, I mean, people back in the old days used. Norton Ghost on Windows, and that's the thing. Um, and, and well, no, really, that's that's where I first came across the kind of idea of machine imaging, um, and, and it's become a bigger and bigger thing, certainly in the cloud. Um, and then I talk about bootstrapping puppets because um, I mean, puppets awesome. I, I think we're all here because we believe puppets awesome, or at least we believe puppet might be awesome. Those of you who are actively using it, um, but there's a whole thing where like you just Start of the machine. You know, it doesn't have an operating system yet. How do you get hooked onto it? Um, so I'm going to talk about that a bit. Um, I, I'm going to talk about continuous delivery. This seems to be a theme today. Um, uh, and how many of you don't know what continuous delivery is? Right, good. That's everybody does know. Um, sorry. Look at book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to. I'm going to assume that everybody kind of knows, at least vaguely, what continuous delivery is. So I'm going to talk about why you absolutely need to be doing this, you need to be doing this, and if you're not doing it at the moment, where you can kind of begin with that, and what the simplest things you can do to deliver a whole bunch of value to your organisation are. Um, I'm going to talk about full end-to-end -end acceptance testing, um, because this is a big thing, um, certainly for, for applications and infrastructure, uh, for development, um, and development organizations are basically 10 years ahead of us, that I think. Um, most companies, developers, will write at least some tests and they'll run at least those tests. Um, but you find sysadmins still, I, I just like, you know, type it, ship it, deploy it, and uh, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, and the answer is quite a lot, you know. Um, I, I mean, any of you who's been using public for a while will have committed the patch that breaks production. Right? Uh, and I've certainly created a few patches that break production, and you suddenly have this, oh my god, 20% of the machines are down, uh, and you know, the remaining 80% are going to go down in the next half hour. Shit. <laughs> um, so, so, actually testing infrastructure, it needs to be a big thing. Um, and another thing I need to talk about a bit is doing multi-region right. So, so if you're in the cloud, um, one of the things it gives you is you can put yourself as close to the customers. Um, and certainly if you're targeting mobile apps or anything like that, that's a really big deal because mobile is slow. Uh, and actually, um, if you're using a mobile app that is hosted on the West Coast of America from here, you can literally tell that it's hosted on the West Coast of America versus it's being hosted in Europe because no, mobile networks are that crappy. Um, and I'm going to rant a little bit about the immutable servers, um, and, and the thing, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to avoid the word immutable, um, at least without air quotes, um, uh, and more, I, I prefer to call it the application's image pattern. Um, so, this is serious business, right? You know, internet, serious business. Well, no, no, I mean, if this is a funny image, um, but, you know, hands up who's being paid to attend today. Right, okay. I asked the wrong question. Hands up who's not being paid to attend today. Right, contractors, hands down. Okay. <laughs> so, you, you, and you, I need to speak to you later. I, I want to employ you. 
Um, I, I'm totally hiring. Uh, we should have a conversation. I mean, if you're fitting yourself to these events, then, then you need to work for someone better like me or pay it to them, right? <laughs> um, so, no, it, really, the internet is serious business. Um, and the world is changing. You know, if, if you, the fact that you're at this event means that you're pretty much, you recognize that the world is changing. <coughs> System administration is not the same thing it was five years ago, and, and in five years' time, it's very much not going to be the same thing that, that it is now. Um, and <coughs> as Chris kind of really nicely mentioned this morning, um, in, in the kind of current economic climate, um, basically, your company has to keep up or die. That's, that's as simple as that, because otherwise, someone who's going faster than you will come and do an end run around you, and they'll take a real business because they can move faster, right? Um, that, that's how it is. So, okay, so, so clouds are wonderful. You know, management loves them, right? Because they have this entire cost center that is like a data center, and, and, and they have servers in it, and have to pay for these servers, etc. And so, to finance and management people, the cloud sounds wonderful. You know, just pay for what you use. You can be entirely flexible, etc. Um, and this is really true. Um, well, you don't necessarily need a data center, but the cloud is not a silver bullet. You know, there aren't any silver bullets anywhere. They just don't exist in technology. Sorry about that. Um, so, okay, serious business. I, I'm in production parts of my business. I mean, maybe my entire business, maybe maybe parts of my business. I'm mean, run serious parts of my business in the cloud. Um, and I'm talking about multiple applications here. Um, I mean, actually Yelp has one main application, which is our web and mobile site, but that's supported by a whole range of kind of back-end services that fulfill parts of that. The idea being that, like if, say, the, the check-ins part of the site is broken, the entire rest of the site doesn't need to be. Um, and I'm not going to talk about kind of service-oriented architectures or, or any of those things. If, if you're not convinced that certainly when you get to the scale of having over 200 developers, which is the sort of scale of we're at, if you're all trying to write the same application at once, it doesn't work so well. You know, I mean, it's great, don't get me wrong, but, but you know, integrating 200 branches a day, maybe it doesn't work so cool. Um, right, and so, um, of course, we're a business, this is serious business, um, so we want really high availability. Um, we're going to be doing significant traffic and significant scale. You know, this isn't mum and pop's website. This is, you know, what is paying my fucking mortgage. <laughs> no, really, it's, it's kind of important. So my mortgage is pretty important to me, right? Um, so, so basically, we're, we're going to build a real data center, quote, quote, in Amazon Web Services. Um, I guess that most people have had a play with AWS. I mean, hands up anybody who's never made a personal AWS account or never had a play. Uh, okay, a few people. A few people, about 10%, 15%. <laughs> um, so you can just register, you can have a play. I would recommend you go and do this. You can just click and you get a machine, and, and it's kind of awesome. Um, but as soon as you start doing this for real business, um, you actually start needing groups of servers of security policies so they can't talk to each other. And then you, know, you need a real data center, all the things you have in a real data center. Um, you know, just, Complexity doesn't just magically go away because cloud doesn't work like that. Um, so you're going to have a proper VPC, that's virtual private cloud. Um, and assuming that you're hybrid, I'm, I'm hybrid, um, you're going to have some sort of VPN from your real servers into the cloud servers. Um, and again, they have 200 developers. I mean, I know that we've got more than 200 developers. I'm just going to use 200 as quite a few. Um, and so you can't just let people have root in the Amazon console um, because that would be bad, okay? Um, I mean, say if you start taking people's money, allowing everybody root in the console, probably not a good idea. Um, so you need to IAM all the things. I can't even remember what IAM stands for. Um, thank you. Identity and access management. Um, Basically, Amazon will let you create users, um, and you can give them very, very granular permissions. Um, and if you're being serious about this, you're going to need to do that. You know, you might want to let some people launch machines, um, but you know, only some people terminate them or different classes of machines. So you, know, you can have small instances, and you can do what the hell you want with them. But I won't let you <coughs> launch C3 XXL2Xs uh, because, well, you know. 
I know that you tend to leave 10 machines running while you go on holiday. That's too expensive, so that people do that. Um, you, know, you, you need, for, for whatever reason, you're going to need levels of security here. Um, and, I mean, a real kicker it is that you have to be prepared to invest in automation investing. If you're big in a cloud, this is a necessity. Uh, you can kind of get away with it if you have your own real data center. You pretty much can't in the cloud. Um, because clouds don't really mean I don't need a data center. Clouds actually just mean it's going to rain on you. <laughs> All the time. Right? Um, because, well, well, you know, we, everybody must have looked after a server at some point that's like, you know, five years old, six years old, seven years old, still running. This thing is still running, like seven years old, it, it's running, you know, CentOS 1 or something. <laughs> uh, and, and crap, this thing is still supporting our mail which is fine, we just leave it in the corner and ignore it. And, and that actually, I, I mean, that's kind of risky if that runs your mail server, if your company you have no backups, but if that mail server was in the cloud, it wouldn't last seven years. Wouldn't last seven years, you know, because Amazon will come along and retire your instances on Christmas Eve. Yeah. <laughs> it will. Um, and, and because it's so easy, you actually find that building machine just happens all the time. You know, I, I mean, you're going to let people. You want people to develop faster and be able to iterate faster. And it's so actually you're, certainly you can't make your sysadmin team be the blocker for progress and change. So you're basically going to let at least a trusted set of your developers launch their own random machines and play with them, it, even if only to play with something they're experimenting with, without having to block on the systems team. Um, so new machines are going to come up and they're going to come down all the time. Um, and entire AZs, um, AZ availability zone. Um, availability zones will fall over. Um, US West 1A had a shit bit last week. Yeah. Back to the first point, Amazon will require instances because they decommission infrastructure and whatever you're running doesn't fit it? Um, basically, because you end up on hardware that's going bad, but then in the, they know that like, you know, the physical hardware that your virtual machine on, it's had ECCM errors on like two of its banks of RAM, mm -hmm. what can you do? Well, they can't turn it off. Well, they can turn it off, and they will turn it off. And they send you this email going, we're going to turn your machine off in like you know, three minutes' time. Enjoy. Uh, no, I mean, usually they give you 24 hours notice, um, usually, um, but, but it can literally be you get an email going, your machine's going away in 20 minutes, uh, you know, and if you're not ready for that, when it comes, it is going to be at the wrong time, I can guarantee it. Um, <coughs> VPNs, they're, they're another one, if you have a VPN into Amazon, um, Amazon, whenever you set up a VPN with them, they give you two tunnels. And the, the reason for that is that you need to connect both of them because they are absolutely gung ho about we're doing maintenance on this tunnel over here, it's down. Uh, and if you don't have failover between the two tools, your VPN will just go down and it'll be bad. Um, if you're a hybrid cloud and you're doing significant traffic, direct connects are a thing. Uh, and I, I very deliberately bolded the S there because if you're thinking of buying a direct connect, uh, don't get at least two because they'll fall over. You know, if you're going to rely on this for your business, well, you, you can't rely on just one for your business. It doesn't work like that. Um, Amazon are pretty good at that. You know, they, they tell you, here are failure zones, and only one of these things will fail at once. And certainly in the last 12 months, I've never seen a, a multi AZ failure, um, or I've never seen like two direct connects fall over at once, or two, you know, so, but, so you can get redundancy. And you can get high availability out of this, but you're going to have to do work. You know, it's, it's, it's not, we can leave it in the corner and ignore it, and I bought good hardware, so it won't fail. Um, that, that just doesn't happen. Um, so, I, I would actually say that the cloud kind of not only lets you iterate faster, you move faster, it, you kind of have to require, it requires you to do this you know, DevOps thing. Uh, I'm not going to define that. Uh, um, because really, if you don't, you'll end up getting trolled. Um, so right, um, I've hopefully convinced you, if you're going into the cloud, you need to do it right, you need to be at least, if not more serious, than if you're buying your own data center space. Um, so, okay, cool. Um, let's build ourselves a cloud, kids. Uh, so we just run Puppet, like you do. 
Uh, and that builds you a VPC, um, and a subnet inside that VPC. Uh, and you run puppets and more, and it builds you a virtual gateway and a VPN, and, uh, and routing tables and all that sort of stuff. And, and this is kind of a line. I mean, like, no, 80% of the code on those slides works. Um, it definitely exists. Um, the root tables, which is the last part, just doesn't, don't work yet. Um, but the, it's on the forward, which is really useful, um, especially for auditing. Um, like, you can just ask, the Amazon API or to your subnets, and it will spit out in like the puppet DSL, here are all your subnets. Uh, and certainly we, we, as we first went into the cloud, um, we basically did it by clicking and drooling on the web interface. And so we ended up with all sorts of networks and subnets and stuff. And six months later, like, what the hell are any of these things? Um, so I actually kind of wrote this more to get information back from Amazon in a sensible format, um, so that I could then put it in a spreadsheet so that I can then go and hit people and go, what the hell is this network for? Why have you assigned it the same IP space as London? That's stupid. Um, <coughs> okay, so, it's a thing. Um, okay, so, so cool. Now, I, 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 I got a cloud, um, whether you click through a console or whether you use my, my crazy alpha quality code. Um, let's make some servers. So, cool. You log into the Amazon console uh, and you click the launch machine button. And, and you click the add my SSH key button, <coughs> and that's so cool. And in fact, it's really easy to get started on Amazon. I, I did say this already. You can boot a community image, um, no matter what Linux based or FreeBSD you want to use, there's a community image. Um, and you can just boot it, and you can SSH in, um, and you can install Puppet and happiness because you've suddenly got the master. Why not? Hours later, I've hit the bit and you've got a flip master. Um, great, oh, that was easy. Um, except, well, uh, kind of puppet masters, um, you need them, but they don't really provide any business value directly. Um, so, you know, we actually need some servers now. Um, so, cool, let's, we we're in the cloud this season, let's get some servers. I'll, I'll just go click launch, 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 and I'll SH into them all. Um, <laughs> and then I'll install Puppet. And then I'll run it. And that, this sounds terrible. <laughs> this, this, really? So I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me to do that. I, I'm, I'm just going to go, no, sorry, you get a D minus. You must DevOps Harley, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> because, I mean, for starters, what happens when your Puppet Master instance gets retired? That's going to be lol. <laughs> you know. Um, so, so, yeah, no. <laughs> I've probably heard this already, but I, I'm going to repeat it because uh, it's worth it. Um, you need cattle, not pets. Right? Cattle, not pets. I, I know that my, my, my cow looks like a pet. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, that's actually a pet. That's my cat now. Um, cool. So, um, we're not going to go into the console and watch machines. That's insane. Or, or no, it's perfectly fine for your first machine. Past that, no. You should not be clicking the console for launch machines unless, unless it's, I want a machine for half an hour to try out some random core project that expects me to curl something and send it to pseudo batch. That's, that's a reasonable thing to start in the console and play with, but other than that, no. No. Your production infrastructure, no. Um, <coughs> cool, so what we're going to have is an imaginary script for launch machines. Um, and I'm going to talk about Ubuntu because this makes it really easy. There's this thing called cloud in it. Um, it comes by default in Ubuntu, and it basically detects, oh, you're being launched in Amazon, and then Amazon lets you give your machines a bunch of kind of per instance metadata when you launch them, um, and CloudNet by default just lets you shove a shell script in there. Uh, and, and this is pretty awesome for a first take, because basically um, you can just send it a shell script, um, and that shell script automates the installation running on the And you know, as soon as Puppet's running, God, everything's lovely. Cool. Um, so, so you then get at what I call ASS, an awful shell scripts. Or honestly, if I wrote it, it's going to be awful because I'm awful at shell scripts. But I don't mind this. Like, who cares if there's a really janky shell script? As long as it works, right? You know, if it works, it provides business value. Who cares if it's a janky shell script? This has an implication. Because when I say working, I mean working when? Working last Thursday, working last month, working last year. Well, <laughs> yeah, 
So, well, I, I'm not going to actually hit the point here. I, I'll let you work out what the point is yourself. So the first rule of backups, someone like to give me the first rule of backups? Don't talk about that. Hey, don't. don't talk about that. That's a good first rule. <laughs> So, so my, my first rule of backups, unlike John's, is if you didn't restore recently, lol. Uh, so my first rule of packaging software, well, if you didn't build an RPM again recently, you probably can't package it anymore. You know, the fact you wrote a shell script six months ago means fuck all. Sorry. Um, and, and, and you know, unsurprisingly, the first rule of server imaging is if you didn't build a fresh server recently, you probably can't anymore. I mean, it might only take you five minutes to find out what changed and changed the script. At 3 a.m., when Amazon just retires, something, not cool, not cool. Um, so the solution to this um, is if it hurts, do it more. And so there's this thing called Packer, uh, which you may or may not come across. Um, it's awesome. If you're, if you, as soon as you get to the point where you have this janky shell script and you're working machines with it, the next step is you basically need Packer. Um, and so it has this, this wonderfully easy to read config. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, sure, sure, whatever. It's a big chunk of JSON. Um, and you can just program, you, you can do it once and programmatically generate it, that's great. Um, it, it works really nicely. Um, and so what Packer does is it, it basically, to use the computer game parlance, gives you an instant level up. Um, because you take your janky shell script um, and it outputs an AMI. And an AMI is an Amazon machine image. And so when you are in the content of the launch and you pick an image to launch, and that's like an installed operating system. Um, and suddenly you've just made your own. So you can now launch your machines in your VPC with all of your settings. And it's awesome um, because it splits the thing that was previously one step into two steps. You have the build new machine image step and your launch step. And the launch step has got massively, massively simpler. Um, and you still have that ASS, um, but that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, because you now have a way to you build individual images, um, and so you now can have a way, we don't have a way yet, we can have a way to only launch the known good images. I mean, that might be, you know, someone writes the image ID of the known good image on the whiteboard and you just type that one into your script. Well, I'd probably recommend you do something cooler, but, um, or more automated, but, but you know, that, that's a thing. You now have the ability to launch images you know of. Uh, and that's suddenly massive business value right there from, from a bit of JSON and, and a horrible shell Um <coughs> Cool, so hopefully everybody's convinced that, that you want to be launching machines that, that you control from your own images. Um, I'll talk a little bit um, about kind of uniform environments now. So um, your production environments and your development environments um, and um, your West Coast US environment and your Asia Pacific environment and, and, and you know because well if you're in the cloud you can be in multiple regions that means it makes sense to. Um, so yeah, what do you develop on? Um, well if the answer is you just launch another machine in the cloud, you did well, that's cool. Um, but sometimes on the train, in fact well, I live in London quite often on the train, kind of sucks. Um, but you want to be able to deal with this. Well, actually, Packer does that too. You, you can build um, vagrant boxes um, on Packer, and, and so you get the same machine image, and you can run it locally on your laptop. Uh, and you end up using the same JSON and, and the same awful shell script, um, which is, is awesome. Um, okay, so, so pet hate. Um, pet hate here. Um, I think it's probably a few other people's pet hate, but the, the Amazon SH key management can basically be described as one word. Lame. Because it's completely disconnected with the IMs. So you have this entire nice running <coughs> on security thing, and completely separate on the side, there's SH keys. What? Um, and so basically the way that Amazon works if you're doing the, the simple DOM thing is you provide an SH key, that SH key gets injected into the instance you're going to launch, and then you can that's how you get in as a root to start with. Um, but we're already packering base images. 
Um, so let's just make the public code that built the base image inline a few admin users into your image, and you don't even need to supply an SHT at launch time. Um, and that, yeah, uh, so build time, Packer is generating an SHT for this build only, but when you put the launch machine, you've already launched it knowing your SHT. So if you have to have SHT into it, you, don't, you just don't need to mess around. Um, so what does a kind of generic image look like? Um, well, this, this is literally a bit no definition for our generic base image. So it just sets up, admin users can log in, and then the base server stuff that we put out on. Um, so there's some kind of launch time scripts for detecting what Amazon environment you're in and tweaking various things. Um, there's all the basic services like NTP and syslog and etc. Um, and that's, that's all DevOps works really well. Um, you, if you get this working, you've delivered a massive amount of business value because, for example, our search team, um, we, we gave them instance launch permissions and we gave them the awful shell script. Um, or, or no, actually, the awful shell script isn't so awful anymore because it's only the launch parts. So actually, it's quite a nice shell script. We gave them the nice shell script. Uh, and they can suddenly scale their search clusters, our search team, but by just like, launch AWS machine, such and such a cluster name, such and such an instance type back, they've got 10 new machines. Now, I mean, how many machines, who built a server yesterday? Okay, who built more than five servers yesterday? Who built more than 10 servers yesterday? Who decommissioned a server yesterday? Who decommissioned more than five servers yesterday? <laughs> who decommissioned more than 10 servers? Right. So, so me and that guy, we are, we're right there. Uh, you know, I, I, must have, I must have spent about 20 minutes, uh, and I built 20 new servers, and I killed 20 old servers. Operated, you know, an entire cluster between Amazon instance types, rolling restarts. Just this level of automation is enough to, to give me something that would have taken days or weeks with traditional methods and traditional hardware. Cool. Okay. So let's revisit that awful shell script. Um, because we can do better, right? We, we, we've, I mean, we've created this kind of problem, or, or at least it feels to me like it's a problem because you're going to have puppet code to manage puppet once on a machine, right? But you've also got this awful shell script that also manages puppet before puppet runs. So you've kind of got this inception problem, um, and, and these can easily get out of sync, and this can cause more or less problems for you. I mean, it can mean that the public just doesn't run at all because you've now got the wrong settings because your awful shell script was setting the wrong settings. It can mean that you're running with completely the wrong environment and you get a production server in dev uh, and suddenly your SSL keys are somewhere they shouldn't be. Oops. Um, uh, it can generally go wrong in a whole load of ways that you probably can't predict. Uh, and if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. You know, it's made up of computers, right? Um, so, so basically, bootstrapping with a shell script is pretty weak. In my so, I thought, what's better than a shell script? Well, a self-extracting shell script. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? So, so I have a few basic puppet modules, like my puppet agent module, my you know, apt module, uh, you know, a few other things that I use everywhere. So what I do is I just create a tar file with these subset of modules in, and you then convert that to base64, jam it into a shell script, and suddenly you have a shell script that you can dummy get and then run and it self-extracts this puppet code and it runs puppet on the puppet code and it's the same puppet code you actually use. So you're using the puppet code you use to configure your server with puppet before you've configured puppet. Magic. You've got exactly one way to configure puppet because you basically you do a small masterless run with a tiny subset of your puppet code to bootstrap puppet yourself. Um, this is pretty crazy, but it works really, really well. Um, so, next, Jenkins all the things. Um, this, this is a small subset of my Jenkins dashboard um, at work. Yeah, exactly. This, this, this was yesterday um, when, when no, not a lot was broken by the time I left yesterday. Um, but no, we, we, so, so Jenkins, what does, what, who knows what, who doesn't know what Jenkins is? Okay. A few people. Okay, so basically Jenkins is a thing that watches your repositories for commits and 
When it sees a commit, it checks your code out and runs a shell script. That's it, basically. Or you know, in, in the key part of Jenkins is that's, that's all it does. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use Jenkins, and every time I commit to the public code, I'm going to then build a new machine, check the public code can bootstrap, and the public can run, and the public can run successfully, uh, and then I will turn that machine out and throw it away. Um, because that gives me a much, much, much higher level of confidence that everything's still working. Um, and of course, you've already done Packer, so Packer does this for you. You know, the, the hard bit here is the copy and pasting of the Jenkins form and trying to work out a descriptive name for the job. <laughs> you know, naming things is the hardest part. Um, so yeah, we run out every commit. Um, if you break the code, the build breaks. Uh, and this is fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic because you get some really, really quick feedback. Um, probably before it's hit anybody else. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I did really well because most of my team is in the States. So actually, I get to break and then fix things before they even come in in the morning. It's good. Uh, <laughs> so cool. We're, we're at a point where we've got basic testing. Um, and so this is like screenshots from Jenkins again. Um, and so the second thing Jenkins can do is if a job, you know, I check this thing out, run this shell script. If that exits successfully, exits or a zero exit status, you can run something else. So what we do is if the public code's changed, then you run a syntax check. Okay, syntax check passes, then you run like rate spec, run the tests in the public code. Um, if that works, then I build my crazy self-extracting um, public bootstrap thing. Um, we then do some tests, like running it and making sure it can extract itself. Um, helps. Um, we then push that up to all the servers, gets deployed, um, and we then start actually running Packer and baking machines. And as you can see, this was earlier yesterday afternoon and it was broken. Um, because me, again, um, that's what happens, that's what I do. So I hope you can see that like, just, just already, we've probably taken you know, what would have taken you a day to throw together, and you spent another day's effort, and you suddenly have this thing that can detect if you've broken the code. You know, with a massive amount of value you didn't have before, just here. Um, this really is anything. Um, because, okay, cool. We, we know that the public ran, uh, and we know it didn't have any errors. Did it make a working box? Can this box resolve DNS? Does its NTP work? Can I run a web application? Does it have a lot right libraries installed? <laughs> No idea. Still. Um, but you can work on that, that's cool. You know, you have to start small, or certainly uh, with the environment I come from, you can't go away for 12 months, spend a million dollars and come back with a thing. That just doesn't work. Um, I, I basically, my personal rule is if I've not shipped something every 48 hours, I'm doing it wrong. Um, so you really can spend you know, a day or two and provide a real amount of value. And then you can build on that incrementally. <coughs> so, yeah, so our simple workflow, we, we don't actually know which git commit is good. Um, and in fact, if, if your puppet takes more than one puppet run, um, then git could have changed underneath you in between runs. Uh, hilarious. What's, what's going to happen? You know, so, uh, and, and the answer is things are going to break, but your tests will still pass. Uh, and then it will all go bad and you'll cry. Um, that's what happened to me very recently. Um, so you need single run convergence. Uh, I you do exactly one public one, that was everything on your server, and you're finished. Um, cool. Um, but yeah, as, as I've kind of said, even the simple thing that I've talked about so far, there's, there's a lot of value there. You can have the testing later. Um, in fact, I tend to kind of do some basic testing when I start something, and I wait for me to hurt myself. Uh, and then I go and add tests or I add workflow that stops me shooting myself in the foot in exactly the same way. Uh, I mean, I've only got two toes left, but it generally works. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, no, being, being serious, um, in this workflow, there's already a really nice place for this to happen. Um, because the thing that I haven't talked about um, yet is you're obviously going to build this machine image in exactly one region, um, say EU West. How does that get to US, West, and Asia Pacific? Well, the answer is you have to specifically make another API call to Amazon to say, please copy this image from, from here to here. And that's great, because you can do this really easily. 
Um, and you just save the machine images from each region, and then you can get things back from Jenkins. Um, and so this is part of my launch script. This is literally part of my launch script. We just grab a text file from Jenkins saying, what's the last successful image? Cool, run that. Works really nicely. Um, and again, you, you can initially, you can just make your image. If you make your image, send it to all the regions. We have this lovely step here that you can like, split apart and add extra testing in later, and that's amazing. Um, so yeah, what's the real testing workflow look like? Well, kind of like that, except not. It's about three more screens. Um, it's quite a lot. Um, and, and we're going to be adding more, because again, I, I have more testing to stop this option than for every time I do it. Um, and basically, getting back to where I started, you need to be agile until it hurts. You need to be agile until it hurts. If you're not frightened, if someone isn't frightened, then, then you're not going to trust Well, no, it's, it's that simple. I, and I'm not saying you should you know, throw good practice out the window or, or be crazy, uh, but someone should be scared. I mean, maybe it's you. If you're really doing it right, you'll be moving so fast you'll scare the developers. Um, you know, maybe it'll be just curious about someone should have concerns. <laughs> if someone is not concerned about what you're doing, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, because, yes, yeah, someone will put you out of business because they're moving faster. Uh, so that's, you, know, you need to balance your risk. You need to balance your risk. And there is always a level of risk. You just need to pick the level of risk that's correct for you and your business. Um, cool. So, I'm running out of time, but that's all right. Um, let's talk about launching the same image anywhere and some kind of anti patterns in that. So one of the things that, that we put, quickly shot ourselves in the foot with um, is that you build in one region and you launch in another region and it doesn't work at all. So this should be one of the first candidates for testing, is test launching in other regions. Um, we found that an anti pattern um, that we've made it is like switch scripts. We have half a dozen scripts that, so when an instance started, it will kind of go and rewrite config files and stuff. Um, and, and don't do this if you can possibly avoid it, because it'll really hurt you. Um, it's not all that hard to think about to make the really dynamic things about which region you're in actually dynamic. You know, there's, there's this whole crazy thing that does that called DNS. <laughs> you might want to use it. Or, you know, if you've got complex requirements, you can go crazy and use Zookeeper. Or, okay, maybe you need to get more significant data onto your image than you can do via a DNS record. All right, sure. Um, you can provide 20K, 50K of, of JSON in your instance metadata. That's no longer an awful shell script, so, so you, can, you can use that. Um, or maybe you could throw, throw the instance and SH key into metadata, and you could use that to check out a Git repository. Or maybe you could come up and rsync something from you know, a, a well-known DNS name that was different in every region. Um, or you could give machines an IAM role, um, and then you, that IAM role lets it pull things from a specific S3 bucket. Uh, you can do this a whole bunch of ways. The trick is to make the instance at start time pull the dynamic data down uh, as part of its boot up. Don't make a shell script that works out what region you're in and fiddles dynamic data because that will uh, it'll just break for you. Um, so one of the awesome tricks to do this, which I haven't come across before Yelp, is DNS dnames. Um, so what we have is a zone in DNS zone called local.yelpcorp.com. Um, and we then use a dname, and a dname basically direct, redirects an entire domain. Um, so we'll have something like you know ntp.local.yelpcorp.com. But then if it's a machine in our SFO1 data center, that will get redirected to local ntp.localsfo1.yelpcorp.com. And so you can get per and really easily the same DNS name on the machine, um, but then depending on the environment it's in, that resolves to a different place. Um, cool, yeah. So um, works really easily for things that are in DNS anyway. Um, another good trick is, is use text records. And small amounts of data like S3 bucket names or you know what application you're launching or you know, whatever's appropriate, you can, you can stick fragments and text records using this pattern works really well. Um, another pattern that we use, um, custom cert names. Um, basically because we have entire networks that are going to be effective on machines that come up and down, um, but we, we have multiple different types of machines sharing the same network space. So now, network local tricks don't really work. Um, 
So what we do is we teach the instance various facts, and then we have a script that runs Puppet for us, and it says Puppet minus minus surname, some fake surname that we've made up, um, that has the Amazon instance ID in it, um, and this works pretty well. Um, as a kind of lightweight ENC alternative, there are various reasons we're not using ENCs. Um, there is a security thing here. Um, like if, if the node is saying I'm, um, you know, I'm a web server and it's not, well, you should be locking things down anyway, right? You know, if you're launching it in a network, you should be launching it with security groups that only talk to the things it can talk to. So this isn't a big problem. Um, or at least this isn't a big problem because we're not doing this for machines which are kind of um, have our public escalation on. So, so it's not a big deal. Um, cool. I've got five minutes left. I'm running out of time. So let's talk about better testing for a couple of minutes. So this is like the bottom part of this diagram. We've seen the top part already. Um, so what we do is like image acceptance testing. So, we're, so we take a base image, um, we stuff a real application into that base image, we run it up, run an actual copy up in a real virtual environment behind a real load balancer. We run the applications end-to-end -end integration tests against that load balancer. We also do a bunch of system checks, things like does your syslog work? Um, does, does your um, reporting for the application login work? Because, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's an outage that I'll tell you about in the pub that was caused by breaking on machine logging things. Um, not cool. Um, so we, we do a bunch more testing uh, and we, we basically pass the base image ID down all the way until we've completed the testing and at that point we take that base image ID and promote it to all the regions again and say, right, this is the good one. Um, and that, that sort of stuff we just can fit it in the workflow you already have. You, know, you can work on it when you have time. Um, so, uh, be a little ranty now, I'm almost finished. The image is an application. Um, so what I've kind of been suggesting is you build a base image uh, and then actually Every application, you, you inject that application, one application into the image, and you build a new server and a new AMI for that. And that works kind of quite well, um, because you want the whole cost to be the same. Um, you can actually, because you're building everything in advance, you don't have to run public on the machines anymore. And that's, that's a double-edged sword. Um, because it means that you run public once a build time, and it means that when I break the public code, it doesn't get deployed across a bunch of servers, but it also means that at 3 a.m. when something's broken, well, the only way to deploy a change to a server is to deploy new servers. And that, that, if you don't do it right, that can hurt. Um, so, I'm really out of time now. Um, these things, if you haven't heard of them, they're Netflix tools. Um, if you're starting the cloud, they kind of have some disadvantages, um, but they do work, and they're worth looking at. Uh, cool, we've talked about this. Right. AMI is for application deployments. AMI creation is slow. Making these images slow it takes like three, four minutes. Copying AMI between regions, slow. Um, only works on AWS, sucks. Um, and yeah, DevOps has to be an opposite. The only way you can push a new application is to push a new version of the machine image. Um, so this is where it gets scary when you start scaring the developers. So you're like, I need to make infrastructure changes. Um, I need to push a new version of your application. And they're like, but the app's broken at the moment. Uh, and, and you're like, well, production's broken at the moment. What are we going to do, guys? <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, so no fun. No fun at 3 a.m. Um, having orchestration that works helps. That, that helps a lot. You can then collect it out to these instances um, you can at least find out what version you're running and what's broken and how many of them there are. Um, that really helps, especially if you're running real metal machines, having a consistent view of all your infrastructure really, really helps. So my prediction, actually, would be that the application's image pattern's going to go away because everybody's, everybody's going to make one image, and that's the image called I run Docker. And then you'll just inject your application into Docker in your image, um, and that's going to be a whole bunch faster. Um, so I'm not suggesting you think a new server paradigm is bad, um, but I, I think it's interesting. It, it depends. It depends. Um, I, I, my conclusions are really, there is no right answer. You know, it, it depends upon what your business is and what you're doing. I don't have all the answers. Um, I've got a bunch of experience. I, I'm definitely not pretending to know 
exactly the right way. I know what's doing it wrong. That doesn't mean I know how to do it right yet. Um, and final note, you can come and help me find them. Uh, we're hiring. Okay. Uh, I am done. This presentation will be on SlideShare in a bit. Um, and I think we're way out of time. <laughs> so, so you'll have to catch me with a lot of questions. Thanks, everybody.